Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable laureates, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry is all about outstanding imagination, creativity, and breaking new grounds, completely new grounds in science, fundamental science. And as you know, the prize is awarded to three venerable gentlemen, Jean-Pierre Sauvage, Sir Fraser Stoddart, and Ben Ferinka, for the design and synthesis of molecular machines, the world's tiniest, smallest machines you can ever imagine. So just think about that for a moment, about the machines. What is a machine? Well, you can define it as a, as a type of construction composed of different uh, components, different parts, working together and designed to produce some kind of useful output as a response of, well, typically energy input. All these parts, they have to be very, very carefully designed they have to be built, they have to be assembled, they probably need to be able to move relative to each other while interacting with one another. This task is quite hard to achieve already at the macroscopic level, but just imagine how, what, a, what a very challenging task it is to, to do this at the molecular level. You know, you can only, in principle, only see these structures through very, very, very sophisticated microscopes. Nevertheless, our three laureates, they took on this, I would say, rather wild and formidable challenge of realizing these kind of machine-like structures uh, at the molecular level. And this challenge not only required exceptional, I have to say, exceptional creativity in chemical synthesis and the design of chemical molecules. And the laureates, all the laureates had to develop fundamental new methodology uh, to, to, to achieve this. But it also required that they develop solutions for the controlled motion of these structures, these constructions, to uh, actually to, to result in machine-like function. So you will hear a lot more of these very spectacular structures and constructions that three laureates have, have, have made during these years uh, in, a, in very shortly. So um, they will tell us much more about their adventures and their journey towards functional molecular machines. And uh, so I will now introduce our first speaker. And it's actually a little bit fitting that the name of our first speaker, Professor Sauvage, reminds us of the quite wild and difficult challenge this has been. Okay, Jean-Pierre Sauvage was born in 1944 in Paris, in France. Uh, he moved around quite a bit when he was young, but finally ended up in Strasbourg, where he he, received a, uh, he was awarded a PhD in 1971 from the University of Strasbourg in northeastern France. And now he is a emeritus professor at the University of Strasbourg and also emeritus director of research at the National Center for Scientific Research, or CNRS, in France. So by that, I want to welcome Professor Sauvage up to the stage. Thank you, Olaf. Uh, well, uh, well, let me start that by saying that it's, a, it's an incredible honor you know, to be here today and to deliver one of the three Nobel lectures in chemistry. I mean, this is something I never dreamt of in the past, I should say. And I uh, would like to thank the, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences 
uh, for selecting our topic, uh, molecular machines, and also for um, uh, selecting me as uh, one of the laureates with the, the two other laureates uh, who are, in a way, uh, good friends of mine. So let me start. Uh, I will also talk about chemical topology today uh, because chemical topology is really, um, to some extent, the precursor, at least for my group, the precursor to molecular machines, and uh, which is, uh, I mean, uh, certainly something important. Uh, just a bit of history. I think history of science is very important, you know, and I, I um, deeply regret that um, very often it's neglected in our teaching. Uh, chemical topology started uh, many years ago in 1961 by a, a very nice publication uh, co-authored by uh, Dr. Frisch and Dr. Wasserman. And these two people, these two scientists, uh, were working in industry. So in a way, it's kind of paradoxical that um, Bell Laboratories uh, was financing research on something which looks completely exotic, in a way, and very far from applications. And Frisch and Wasserman just published a discussion. There were no experiments, um, nothing in there, just a discussion on chemistry and topology. And it was the first time that those two words, actually, chemical and topology, were associated. And, uh, and thus, um, I think it is a very important paper, uh, because for the first time, a chemist uh, could see that some molecular graphs or some graphs can be uh, planar or non-planar, uh, although the, the molecules could contain exactly the same sets of chemical bonds and atoms. So the, I think that was the very beginning. And now experimentally, um, I think the most important contribution comes from Germany, uh, from Freiburg in Germany, very, very close to my own city, Strasbourg, maybe 80 kilometers uh, southeast. And in particular, Professor Schill and uh, his, uh, his boss, Professor Lüttringhaus, uh, a legendary organic chemist, Professor Lüttringhaus, uh, they published a paper in 1964 uh, in Angewandte Chemie. Uh, Peter, I hope you are sensitive to that. Uh, and it was a very important paper, historical paper, that was the, the synthesis of the first catenane, two catenane consisting of two interlocking rings. Um, it was brilliant work, very, very elegant, but in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, practical outcome, um, it was not so uh, spectacular uh, because they needed many, many steps, and the, the overall yield of the process was certainly um, very modest. And so the people at the time uh, were very impressed by the work, uh, but they were not so enthusiastic uh, trying to make catenanes themselves using strategies uh, similar to those published in this uh, historical paper. And for some years, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, uh, the field became uh, less active. Um, and at the beginning of the 80s, when my group started in this field, it was really a dormant field. So nobody was, basically, nobody was working in this field. And uh, Professor Hansen, in one of his letters, suggested that uh, um, we, we may, or we are invited, in a way, uh, to talk about the story behind the discovery. And I think it is a, a very good and a very good point. You know, it's an important statement. Um, how did you get the ideas? How did you start the work? And uh, that's what I'm going to explain you. So at the, the beginning of the 80s, when I started my own group, um, I was very much interested in inorganic photochemistry. 
trying to uh, split water, the water molecule, to H2 and O2. And of course, it was a big, big challenge, which is uh, still a challenge today. And there were many uh, important transition metal complexes uh, which were expected to be important and interesting uh, in relation to water splitting. And I had done some work in this field, in particular with my uh, supervisor, Jean-Marie Lane. Um, and the, the main complex was a, a ruthenium complex. And ruthenium is very expensive. And we thought that copper, a copper complex could be uh, practically more interesting and if applications were expected, um, copper would be certainly more attractive than ruthenium. And Dave McMillan spent a year in Strasbourg on sabbatical leave from Purdue University. And we were making some uh, strange molecules, strange to him, relatively simple to us. And when he saw this molecule, which we had made in my group, he said, we must collaborate. Uh, we are photophysicists and photochemists. Uh, you are uh, molecule makers, in a way. And so let's collaborate. And we collaborated. We made a copper complex of this type containing two diphenyl phenantholines. So this is phenantholine. This is jargon. You can forget about it. Uh, but there are two nitrogen atoms here which are able to interact with copper. So we, we made this complex, and it turned out to be very exciting in terms of photochemical properties, in terms of photophysics. It had a, a long lifetime uh, for its excited state. Uh, it could transfer electrons. It could do many, many very interesting things. So that was the very beginning, because if you look carefully at the structure, you realize that if you connect this point to that point, separately this point to that other point here, you make a catenane. Very, very simple. Let me do it with a better laser pointer. If you start from here, you will connect this point to that point, separately this point to that other point, and you have a catenane. And so we decided to, in a way, to stop, more or less, inorganic photochemistry, and we jumped towards organic synthesis and towards the making of catenanes. And I think the, um, the main requirement was to be experimentally able to jump from inorganic photochemistry to organic synthesis. And at the time, I had a very good friend, Christian Dietrich Buschecker. And this very good friend was a CNRS researcher in another group. And uh, she decided to come and work with me. So basically, we started the, the group almost together. And she was a great organic chemist, a fantastic synthetic chemist. And thanks to her, all the work I will now discuss um, could be done. So we published the first paper in 1983. Uh, it's here, 1983 in a, let's say, um, reasonably good quality journal, but not a top journal, not a high impact journal. Uh, and we published it in French. That could be surprising. Uh, we published it in French because we had the feeling that it was a, um, perhaps it would become an important paper. Um, I mean, it's pretty easy to understand what it means. You know, une nouvelle famille de molécules, de molécules, les métallocatenanes. Uh, do I need to translate? Uh, <laughs> so that was the very first paper. And I will now explain you a little bit more in detail uh, how we, uh, we proceeded. Uh, so we, you know, after this first paper, this uh, first paper, we really generalized the concept, uh, which we call a transition metal templated uh, principle. So we will use a transition metal as, uh, let's say, the, the templating species, able to gather various organic fragments to orient them in a three-dimensional space, 
and to maintain them in a given geometry. So it's quite easy here. We start from the transition metal center. We have two organic fragments able to interact with the metal. Uh, we generate what we used to call the entwined structure. We make a ring here, we make a ring here, and of course, at the end of the day, we obtain a catenane. Very, very simple. Uh, we could also be a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, we start from a ring which contains a uh, coordinating fragment here. We mix with the transition metal, uh, the open chain um, fragment, which is able to interact with the metal. Uh, and so we will obtain this uh, assembly. And finally, we make a ring from here to here using a GG fragment. And we used to call that the gathering and threading strategy. If you like, I think nowadays we would see the assembling and, and threading strategy. Just a brief uh, look at the molecules. Um, so we start from uh, the molecule, uh, a very simple molecule, again containing this uh, building block here, the phenanthaline with its two nitrogen atoms. Um, just in passing, this is not chemdro, this is uh, um, Indian ink drawing, you know, uh, a very old drawing, historical drawing. And in a way, I think it can compete with chemdro. Uh, so we take two such molecules, copper one, uh, we generate the entwined intermediate, as I said before. This compound can be made at the, the 10 gram scale within um, a couple of days. So this is very, very easy. We do not even isolate this species. We go on, and now we proceed to the, the double cyclization reaction. Uh, we take a long organic fragment, no need to discuss the, the methodology. Uh, we will uh, interconnect those two points here and separately those two other points at the back. So this is exactly what we have seen uh, on the, the strategy slide. And we can make, uh, let's say, half a gram of such a molecule, which is a catenane. Now we have indeed our two interlocking rings and a central copper one um, uh, uh, metal here. Uh, in uh, the yield was not very good, but I mean, it was so straightforward that um, in a way it changed completely um, the, the situation, and I think it changed also the, the way chemists were looking at catenanes. So they were not completely exotic species. They were not completely impossible to make species. Uh, they, be, they became, all of a sudden, accessible molecules. We were lucky enough uh, to crystallize those species. So this is the copper complex catenane. Uh, you see the X-ray structure, which is really kind of a picture of the molecule, a real picture of the molecule. I can move it so that maybe you can see it better. Uh, the copper one center is green here. Um, in passing, this is ridiculous because all these complexes are deep red. Uh, but we had a, 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 green, uh, a green ball here to put. And if you demetallate, the system rearranges completely, and uh, this is reversible. And once you have rearranged the system, you have a very open structure. Uh, the two rings can glide freely within the other. You have very little control over the geometry of this species, but it's a complete metamorphosis. And this is the way we call the process a metamorphosis. So this being said, I should say that we became interested in catenanes for um, several reasons, but probably the main reason was that uh, catenanes are and knots. Uh, so this is a knot, this is a catenane, a, a slightly more complex catenane than the one we have seen. They are ubiquitous in nature, uh, in DNA, uh, in proteins, in uh, viruses even. Uh, we have no time to see so many examples, but here just DNA, 
uh, forms uh, beautiful topologies and, uh, and continuously. I mean, it's not something which is really exceptional, it is something which is routine. Uh, so a bit of history. Um, so there were, of course, um, a lot of interest triggered uh, by um, the synthesis of catenanes. Uh, I would like to refer to the beautiful work of um, our good friend, Fraser, uh, who really blew up the field in a way. Uh, so we started as a modest small group in France and uh, I think basically there was an explosion thanks to, to him and his group. Um, in the UK, uh, Chris Hunter and uh, Fritz Fuckley, they used hydrogen bonding as uh, assembling um, entities. Uh, Makaru Fujita did also beautiful work based on the palladium nitrogen bond, which is labile and thermodynamically stable. And I think uh, I stopped in 1994. And after that, there were too many uh, contributors, so that there would be a too long list, you know. Uh, but there was beautiful work, which is still um, done now. And I would like to thank all the people who joined the, the team, so to say, the worldwide team of uh, catenanes and rotaxanes and other species. Uh, just in passing, uh, there was a pioneer, uh, Hiroshi Ogino at Tohoku University in Sendai, who also uh, published a beautiful piece of work with cyclodextrins and transition metals. Just before we uh, start the, the molecular uh, machinery part of my short lecture, uh, a few topologies which have been made in my group, you know, mostly for the, the challenge that uh, making these topologies um, uh, represented. So that was the first system, a catenane, a three catenane, a very simple topology uh, in 86, 87. Uh, we had the X-ray structure in 87, and that was the cover page of uh, ungoverned chemi. Uh, the the trefoil knot uh, was very, very challenging. It took us years and years, but thanks to Christian Dietrich Bischeke, you know, we succeeded. And uh, the, the doubly interlocking catenane, which is represented here, uh, was mostly the work of Jean-François Nierengarten, um, another great synthetic chemist. And now let's talk about molecular machines shortly. And uh, just referring to biology, because biology is really a source of uh, inspiration for chemists. Uh, we knew that in biology, uh, molecular machines are everywhere. Again, uh, you cannot think of any important biological process uh, not using motor proteins, so um, molecular machines. So ATP synthase is an example, and there was some beautiful work um, done in, uh, in many places on ATP synthase and the understanding um, of uh, its um, function on, and the way it works. Uh, kinesin is also an important, a very important molecular machine with a small protein which can walk on a rail, the rail being a microtubule in the cell. Uh, so there are many, many, many examples. What about catenanes and rotaxanes? So catenanes and rotaxanes uh, are certainly very attractive in this respect. Uh, you can uh, quite easily figure out that a ring can glide uh, along the axis on which it has been threaded from a position, let's say, to another position and, and vice versa, go back to the original position. A ring could be hopefully able to rotate about the axis, or again, in a catenane, a ring perhaps uh, can glide, can rotate within the other ring. So very attractive structures for making molecular machines. Uh, just, um, I know it's a very dangerous slide because uh, maybe in the audience there are people who had done some beautiful work uh, in the field of molecular machines, but I tried to collect, you know, the 
some of the, of the names um, of the most successful groups um, in the field of molecular machines based on interlocking, on catenanes and rotaxanes. And Fraser Stollert and his group, Vincenzo Balzani, um, Akira Harada, I mean, they have done beautiful work. David Lee, who was a student with uh, Fraser, and many, many other groups nowadays uh, using catenanes and rotaxanes to uh, make molecular machines. So now I will just um, show you what we did in Strasbourg uh, in relation to molecular machines. So the idea was quite simple. Um, it was to take a catenane, a relatively simple catenane, and to move it. And the way we did was the following. So we have copper one here. And you know that copper has two oxidation states, copper one and copper two. Copper one likes to be four coordinate. It likes to be surrounded by four nitrogen atoms so as for it to be tetrahedrally uh, surrounded by nitrogen atoms. Copper two plus, uh, on the other hand, um, is much more demanding. Copper two plus likes to be five coordinate or even six coordinate. Six coordinate with an octahedral geometry uh, with uh, Jan Teller distortion or five coordinate. And so now we will play with that. The requirements of copper one are not at all the same as those of copper two. Let's start from copper one. Here we have a very happy copper one, and the copper one ion can be oxidized to copper two, copper two plus. But this copper two plus is still four coordinate, tetrahedral um, uh, surrounding, and this is not satisfactory at all for copper two. So the system will uh, relax uh, so as to find a more satisfactory situation in terms of uh, thermodynamics, which means that the ring will glide here. The, the three nitrogen atoms which are here will replace the two nitrogen atoms which are here originally, and the ring will glide a half term so as to generate a happy copper two. So copper two is now five coordinate. It, is, it forms a very stable complex and nothing moves anymore, apart from Brownian motion, of course. And this is very pleasant also to monitor for uh, the people who did the work. Uh, we start from a deep red complex. We obtain a deep green complex. You have to be patient. It takes a minute or so. And after the, the deep green complex, you obtain a yellowish complex. Uh, not a very nice color, by the way. And if you go back, uh, you oxida no, sorry, you reduce, you inject an electron in the copper two center, you generate a five coordinate copper one, and this five coordinate copper one is, a, is very unhappy, and the complex will rearrange so that the ring will glide again and you regenerate the starting state of the molecule. So that was the first uh, molecular machine in our group. Um, it's not really a rotation, it's a pirouetting system. And I insist uh, from the very beginning, we have no control over directionality. And if you want to, uh, to know more about rotary motors, uh, of course, you have to read uh, all the literature published by the group of Ben Feringa. I have a simple video, uh, okay, uh, which I will show you. It's a video which was made by uh, um, a student of mine uh, who is now in the Netherlands. So we have copper one. We have here a phenantraline with its two nitrogen atoms. And here we have the second phenantraline here so this is copper one with four nitrogen atoms. Now we will abstract an electron. It's a blue electron, if you noticed. And the blue electron re being removed, we have copper two. The system rearranges, and you have now a five coordinate copper two. You can re-inject the electron, not the same, of course. 
and you reform the four coordinate complex. And I think the beauty of the system is that you can do it as many times as you like um, with molecules. Um, of course, you can do it as many times as you like in silico. Um, but with molecules too, everything is perfectly clean, perfectly quantitative, uh, so that um, it's, it's a nice, um, very reversible and clean system. Um, so I will have very li limited time to talk about molecular muscles, uh, but let me just show you the principle. So we wanted to make um, a molecular system which is reminiscent of molecular muscles in the sense that uh, uh, contracting or uh, elongating molecular muscles means gliding filaments. So you have filaments which glide along one another. Uh, so you have the, um, the relaxed form of the muscle here, the contracted form of the muscle, and you see that those filaments simply glide. And what we did uh, was to design and make a molecule. It was a relatively complex, complicated molecule. We made a molecule uh, which behaved in exactly the same way. Uh, this is a rotaxane dimer. And uh, what we could show is that we can contract it uh, and we send another signal to the molecule. We can elongate it and contract it. And this can be done, you know, uh, many times. Um, we have no time, I assume, for yeah, two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's very accurate. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we have no time for discussing, you know, the work in detail. And I will skip all that. Uh, some very important slide, I think, uh, will be the, the slide gathering the names and the, of the people who did the work. Um, at first, I would like to conclude. This is my conclusion slide. Uh, transition metals are very important. In our case, you know, we, were, we are more coordination chemists than supramolecular chemists, to be honest. Uh, but transition metals played a very important role in our chemistry. Uh, they allowed us to build the system uh, using uh, templating uh, principles. So the transition metal can gather and um, dispose the various organic fragments um, around the metal in a very well defined and very well controlled way, which allows to make target molecules of interest. And due to the presence of the transition metal in the molecule, um, the system um, uh, has interesting electrochemical properties and photochemical properties. And this is how we could move the molecules uh, or let's say set some parts of the molecules in motion, uh, such as uh, uh, two or three state swinging catenanes. We have seen the two, two uh, state swinging catenane, uh, molecular shuttles. We made a wing flapping rotaxane and contract, contractile and extensible molecular systems uh, reminiscent of muscles. So I will stop at this stage. Let me just say one word uh, of the, uh, the French system. You know, the, the French system, I'm not sure it's perfect, uh, but there are good, good points in it, uh, provided you adapt your policy to the French system, uh, it can be efficient. And in particular, we have permanent people uh, working in our groups, and we were working in my group as a group of permanent people. I was considered the, the leader of the group, uh, but the other permanent people were friends you know, most of the time. Some of them were of my generation. And these are the people you know, working with me, not all of them at the same time, but uh, Christian, Jean-Claude Chambron, uh, who is now in Dijon, Jean-Paul Collin, who is now completely retired, uh, Valérie Heitz, who is a professor in our university, uh, and some younger, younger members, CNRS members or assistant professors. Uh, so Jean-Marc Cairn passed away in, a, uh, in an aircraft uh, accident, in a crash, 
many years ago, so th that was also a, a very bad moment. And I have a special thought for uh, my two first PhD students, Pascal Marneau and Romain Rupert, uh, because I think at the beginning, you know, it's important to work with very motivated uh, students, and they were indeed very motivated. I'm not going to read the list of people uh, who participated in this uh, um, project or adventure on catenanes, rotaxanes, and knots. Uh, just um, perhaps the work on the muscles was mostly carried out by a Spanish postdoc, an incredibly active Spanish postdoc, uh, Maria Consuelo Jimenez. And the work on the, the swinging catenane, the very first molecular machine, uh, that was mostly the work of Oliver. Finally, um, let me thank my university and uh, the CNRS also, which had a very important uh, uh, contribution. Uh, the European communities, you know, without the European communities, I don't think we would have been able to do uh, as much work as we did. And the, the Région Alsace, which is around Strasbourg, my city. Uh, we have a, a foundation which was also very helpful. Uh, my new institute, because I had to move five years ago after I retired officially, um, ISIS, uh, Northwestern University, thank you, Fraser, uh, for um, arranging for me to spend uh, several years part-time in a fantastic environment. I would like to thank my supervisor when I was a postdoc in Oxford, uh, Malcolm Green, a great organometallic chemist. Uh, the two most influential teachers, uh, Guy Ourisson and Raymond Weiss. Finally, of course, my wife. She has been, always been um, very supportive. And uh, this was also true for our son, Julien. And I would also like to thank the two other laureates, Fraser and Ben, because without their great contributions, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you.